Hello, my name is Glenn Price, and I'm here with the CCM Wind Orchestra, as today we do a demonstration video of Eric Whitaker's October. This is a beautiful piece, and I'm hoping that we can use it in a couple of ways, not only to discuss elements that are specific to October, but also to talk in a general kind of way about how to use your imagination in combination with the specific elements one can find in the score to create an interpretation that has a little extra interest. First of all, we have a couple of housekeeping details having to do with some errata. So there are just a few. Uh, in the E-flat clarinet at bar 35, the last note should be an F. In bar 36, it should be marked third horn, not second horn. Two after E, in the second trumpet, there should be a sharp added to the F. And finally, six bars before F, uh, remove the breath marks and also add ties to the held notes in the first clarinets so it corresponds to the same style as the introduction. Finally, keep in mind that for any composer, everything is a conscious choice, whether it's a dynamic or an orchestration. So think about why, in particular, an instrument has been selected or a group of instruments or a dynamic or articulation marking, because I think those things will bring us closer to the composer's original intention. It's usually helpful to learn a bit about the composer. In the case of Eric Whitaker, he's one of our younger composers who's also been heavily influenced by film music and by uh, commercial music and also by choral music, for which he's well known for having written. Uh, in this case, the title, October, gives us a lot of clues as well to the piece, and he's given us an, an excellent program note which discusses a little bit about his intent. In particular, his reference to the English Romantic composers of Elgar and Vaughan Williams give us a real clue. And I think if we could isolate one phrase, which is the natural and pastoral soul of the season, which I think really distills the, the character that he's looking for here quite a lot. In keeping with the character of the English Romantics, I think the element of rhythmic push and pull and also dynamic variety makes perfect sense. And in this particular case, he's used the horn section as generally the lead instrument, which can also provide that kind of English uh, romantic color, as well as leading the push and pull in the phrase. One last point related to that, there are several occasions where the melody is tied over a bar line. In those moments, it's helpful to kind of push forward a little bit on the phrase. Some of those examples are in the trumpets at the sixth and seventh bars after E, in the euphonium at the seventh and eighth bars after E, and in the flutes in uh, 12 and 13 bars after F. A little bit of expressive push and pull adds a lot to the piece. All right, so let's begin. We're going to start by uh, doing one thing out of sequence, and that is to identify the three main locations of the melody at C, sorry, at A, at C, and at G, and do two things with it. First of all, just organize so there's some differentiation between those three points. The first occurrence of the main melody. Thank you. And let's go to the melody only at the second appearance, uh, which is at letter C, directly on C, melody only. So this should be slightly warmer, slightly bigger. The orchestration is richer as we move from mezzo forte to forte, but still just a light forte at C. Thank you. And now the third appearance, which is at G, please, melody only. Fortissimo, but still a very rich, warm, and dark singing color. Okay, now let's add the others going in reverse. We'll do letter G, please, with the full ensemble. Thank 
climax. So knowing that that's our destination for the climax, the strongest point of the melody, let's use that as a reference point as we back up to the second appearance at C with everyone. So a noticeably more gentle dynamic. And finally, the first appearance, which is at A with pick up everyone. Excellent. Now, while we're at this spot, let's talk about a couple of other related points. Uh, notice that the first appearance of the melody is broken into four phrases. We need to make sure that we organize each of those phrases around the dynamic high point of the top pitch. So we have ya da 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 ya da 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 da. Then the next one da 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 ya da 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 dum ba da 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 ya. The strongest of it ya da 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 da. Ba, da, da, et cetera. So the, the dynamic shape going to the contour of the top pitch of the third phrase is really important. Also, that octave leap is helpful if we approach very gently by being a little extra strong or firm on the lowest note, taking your time and then going up gently to the top note. Can we have everyone please, at the pick up to A, listening for those top notes and the gentle arrival on each one. Pick up to A, A everyone please. additional point before we leave this location. In the final few measures, the flutes have a main line, but it descends. And as it goes into the lower register, it's very easy for it to be covered by the other instruments. Could we just isolate that for a moment? And I hear starting at the fermata, at the pickup to three before B, first of all, um, just the flutes and clarinets, starting on the fermata. So those instruments with the descending eighth notes slightly uh, more prominent would be really good. And notice that it's only the second flute that has the low D flat. Kenneth, could you favor us with your D flat? Very low in the register. And so with the other instruments playing, you need to give some extra emphasis to that so it doesn't get covered. Everyone, please, the pick, uh, pick up to three before uh, B, listening for those dynamic elements. Tutti, pick up to three before B. Yeah, we can probably even favor that slightly more so there's an even bigger uh, differentiation. All right, now we're at the beginning of the piece. And we're going to start by uh, playing the opening introduction in a, an acceptable, but I'm going to request the group to play in a fairly generic fashion. So nicely, just as is written. And then we'll do a few touch-ups and hopefully you'll notice a difference. Beginning, please.
very well played. Now let's add a few touches, some of which we can discover by looking at the score, thinking about the title and the atmosphere that he's trying to create, and then maybe using a little bit of imagination. So for example, rather than having the clarinets and the wind chimes just begin as marked, can you do it please, just as it's written? Bar one. Like an announcement, maybe it can just come in very gracefully and gently, kind of like a, some attractive fragrance off of the, uh, the breeze. So the wind chimes, of course, lends itself particularly well to that. It can be sporadic and very gentle to begin with. Likewise, the clarinets don't really need to come in together at all. All we really need is for one person to come in somewhere in the general vicinity of a downbeat is fine. So play in your comfort zone and uh, let's do those things, just uh, starting at the very beginning. Because there, after all, is no sense of rhythm here. It should feel kind of timeless. And then we go on into the, into the next section. Now, in the next section, we have the accompaniment in the clarinets. Can I hear just the uh, accompanying clarinets, bar three? Yeah, this can just be kind of gentle, like sighing or breathing. And then the beautiful oboe solo here can also be very expressive and take some liberties with the rhythm. Can I hear bar three, just the accompaniment clarinets and the oboe? Yeah, and even this, to begin with, can be a little bit more sotto voce, a little bit more under, intentionally underplayed, so it has somewhere to go, as it's kind of keeping in keeping with this idea of something coming in off of the breeze. Um, a couple of other things. In the oboe solo, when we go to the fifth iteration of the melody, rather than doing the diminuendo of this mark, it may be useful to instead make a small crescendo to bring us into the next section. So could we do that, please? One, two, three, four, five. So this is bar seven with everyone, please. Bar seven. To here. Thank you. Excellent. Now, we're at two bars before A. Can I hear just the oscillating two-eighths quarter figures, please? <coughs> two before A. Yeah, now notice what the players are doing here beautifully well is a little bit of give and take as they arrive at the longer note, backing away gently to make room for the, the uh, people who have the eighth notes that move. Another aspect of how the piece is written is that this innocent looking accompaniment actually becomes the pickup note uh, of the melody. And so forth. So it has a little extra significance. It's not just accompaniment. All right, we're going to put all of that together and we'll play from the beginning to A with everyone, uh, hopefully illustrating all of those changes we just discussed. One request, too, I, I neglected to mention. The symbol sounded beautiful, but because of the kind of autumn atmosphere of this, perhaps something a little bit darker would be even better. So if we could switch to a darker symbol at the opening here, that would be fantastic too. Okay, so beginning to um, A please, with all of those little adjustments. Thank you, that was beautiful, everyone. Hopefully this adds a little bit of poetry or magic uh, to, this, to this piece. 
All right, now we've played the section at A, so now we're at B. And rather than having the group play in a generic way, we'll just save some time and we'll make a few comments and then play the section with these recommended suggestions. Um, at B, it can be, um, we can create a little bit more dynamic variety and expressive variety by making this very tender and melancholy um, answer with more coloration by making it slightly breathy. I'm gonna ask you to, to intentionally do a couple of things. Make the tone, rather than being full voiced, full bodied, a little bit breathy and pay some extra attention to the lengths of the last notes, which I'll ask you to make slightly longer. Okay, so here's the pickup to B, please. That was beautiful. Um, can I ask for a couple of other small bits here? Six before C, measure 25. Normally, as conductors, we try to look for the long line, but this may be an opportunity to actually break the line up. Can we please play it as written once, please? This is the pickup to six before C, yada da 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 da, etc. It's very nice like it is, but perhaps um, recognizing the, um, the sequence and the falling gesture, we can break it into smaller units like this. We try it like that, please. Nice. And just while we're at it, can I ask for these instruments, please? Five before C, flute two, clarinet two, trumpets two and three. Can you just play what you have here? Yeah, you're the only ones moving with that descending eighth line. If you could enrich it as you descend, please. Great, and do just what you did with take a little bit more time over it. Can we have everyone please, six before C plus pick up with those two changes, breaking it into smaller phrase fragments and also enriching the descending eighth note line five before C. So here's six before C plus pick up. Beautiful, thank you very much. Now, let's go to um, the setup of the second appearance of the melody at C that we've already played. In order to prepare that significant arrival, architecturally significant arrival of the return of the main melody, the bar before C, it's useful if we just take a bit more time to let it blossom and stretch. So could we take just the uh, two bars before C and we'll look at how we can take a little bit more time in the bar before C. Two before C, everyone please. Thank, thank you. And if you were listening closely, you heard that descending eighth note line again, ya da di da dum, that we just rehearsed in the clarinet, flute, and trumpet, appears here again. Perhaps we could add a bit more emphasis to that, which also helps the rhythmic and dynamic pacing of the return to the main melody. Everyone please, uh, two before C. Thank you very much, well done. 
There's a small point coming up here that maybe we should demonstrate. The subito mezzo piano in bar four after C is easy to miss the, I think, the dramatic significance of this. So it's helpful if we do two things. Stay firm, dynamically firm prior to it, so it really sounds like a dramatic change when it occurs on beat four. So could we please play from the pickup to the third of C, just to demonstrate that, the dynamic gradation from the full sound to the subito mezzo piano. Third of C plus pickup. Just an interpretational slash acoustic point, it's important to let the sound breathe so the release sound can't be hurried. If we go into the subito mezzo piano too soon, it's just acoustically covered by the sound in the room. If we demonstrate that one more time, please. We'll be conscious of letting the sound in the room subside slightly just to clear the air for the mezzo piano. So that was the third of C plus pickup. Very nice, we just need to make room in that way for all of those things. Okay, and we won't play this, but let me just make a note of the return of this accompaniment figure we had earlier, this di da dum di da dum two before D and the trumpets and trombones, who want to treat it exactly the same way that we did in the introduction with the clarinets and the flutes, which I know you will when the time comes. So now we are at D. Let's play a little bit and then we'll talk about rehearsal D. done. So, as I mentioned at the beginning, it's important for us to consider that every choice is a conscious choice for the composer. The composer has chosen euphonium, which is always a fantastic solo instrument, but why in this piece in particular might it be used? Uh, although Eric Whitaker and I know each other and have worked together, I've actually not had this discussion with him, so he may disagree, but my sense is it's quite logical that this is the ideal solo instrument for this mellow moment in the middle of the piece, partly because the euphonium is in some respects kind of the quintessential British instrument. It's extremely well known in the brass band world, and the, the mellow quality it adds to the, this moment of this piece works beautifully well. Another touch of the English romanticism uh, occurs here in our also fairly British sounding horn section. Can you play for us your forte piano? in the fourth bar of D. Yeah, so this kind of color painting or tone painting of distant English hunting horns makes perfect sense for setting up the kind of atmosphere we have here. The trumpets have exactly the same figure uh, in the seventh and eighth bars. So let's listen for those, for those things. So here's um, at D with just a couple of other suggestions. In the um, clarinets, let's make the tremolo very fast and fluttery, kind of light, not too robust, with also a bit of a heavy arrival on the first note each time. So for just the clarinets, please, the tremolo. Beautiful, so just that little rush or gush of sound at the beginning and then light and fluttery after. And uh, Dan is doing a beautiful job with the solo. And for any euphonia soloist to encounter this, it makes perfect sense to invite them to take a lot of liberties, both dynamically and rhythmically. So it sounds fluid and somewhat spontaneous. Um, let's mention one other thing that we've just arrived at and then we'll put it together. In the fourth and fifth bars after D, we have this little woodwind comment, ya da di, ya da 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 Can we also reinforce the kind of uh, uh, 
uh, breathy aspect here uh, and emphasize the length of the arrival notes. Okay, so I hear all of those people. This is the pickup to the fifth of D, your little answer. Right. Can I ask for two things? The finishing eighth note, a little fuller and more time, so we hear it, and slightly longer on the um, downbeat of the fifth bar. You may wish to mark a tenuto over that note as a reminder. So, and then take your time to come off of it. One more time, please. Same thing. Excellent job in the bassoons. Um, what you could also do is just be a little extra careful. Those of you who have the same pitch twice on beat four and and, it's, some, it's on the brink of not being able to hear the rhythm on ya da da. So just a little bit more definition. I'll trust you to do that as we put it all together at D, please, with those small adjustments. Everyone, right on D. Thank you. Very, very well done. So, as we build up into letter E, we've had the contrast of this mellow euphonium moment at D. At E, we've got contrast again in many respects. Uh, first of all, it's a substantial departure from the introductory material or either of the two themes we've had so far. It's tutti, full, simple rhythm, and it kind of foils our expectation that the return of the main theme, which sounds like should have happened at E, the way it's set up right before it. So can we do this, please, starting two before E. Notice that it sounds because we are, have been set up to expect the main theme by this ya da dim ya da dim da 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 figure, but this time it doesn't happen. And instead we have this very, very different kind of sound. So here's two before E, everyone, please. <laughs> Now we need to touch up a few details here in order that the richness of the, of the material comes through. First of all, um, can I ask for these people at E, the descending quarters alone once. Just play a bit more full bodied style here. Good, now that needs to hold its own against the half notes and whole notes that are going on in the rest of the group. So we'll probably need to play out even a little bit more. Now I'll ask you to do one other thing too, which is to lean on beats one and three, the suspension. So we hear dia, dia, dia. So we can get a little bit more of the tension out of that. And Great, now with everyone, be careful to not lighten up too much on two and four or they'll disappear when everyone's playing. Let's try that with everyone, please, at letter E.
Thank you. Okay, and now we finally do have a return to some familiar material, which is the return of the introduction. As we go into the introduction, the clarinets who move, can you bring your lines forward a bit more for two reasons? One, there's a suspension built into it, and also the last half note before the first 5-4 bar just needs a bit more sound to support it. Uh, so we'll do that when we have everyone together here. So if you look at the score <clears throat> at 6 before F, it's very, very much like the introduction, but there are a couple of important differences. And I think the main one is a fairly unusual use of the, of the bass clarinets, and then we now have two, two, rather than one. So I think that's something we should celebrate, maybe highlight a bit. So I think that we can do two things. We want to enrich the lower register of the clarinet section, after all, that's why you're there, and then let the clarinet choir sound in its full complement with that really rich clarinet choir sound. Could we isolate just you for a second, please? This is six before F, just the clarinets. What a fantastic accompaniment to set up the return of our solo oboe. Okay, we'll put all that together in just a second. Time's up. Okay, <laughs> right now, can we take this, please? Find the 5-4, 6 before F, and since I mentioned the clarinets, let's start before that. Uh, two bars plus pickup. Everyone find that all right? Eight plus pickup before F. expressive. Thank you, another very beautiful solo. Clarinets, three before F, you have only a quarter note. We need to favor that in a couple of ways. Make it slightly long and make the taper of it really smooth so there's no bump coming off of that into the oboe solo. We don't need to demonstrate that. I know it'll be great when we do it. Okay, rehearsal F is another opportunity to make some variety in the piece. Um, perhaps we should play it first in a generic way. So everyone, please at F. Okay, I mentioned a theme at the beginning about looking for the in internal evidence in the score, what choice has been made, and then also using your imagination a little bit. See, the internal evidence here is what instruments are being used, or more importantly, what instruments are not being used. The low register instruments are, are left out intentionally to create a different color. But this color also moves in a way that rhythmically is extremely smooth. So maybe we could reinforce those ideas with how we treat our tone color. So I'm gonna make a couple of specific requests here. Let's try one per part uh, to contrast the adjacent material. And let's have the others join in bar four, uh, beat three or four, depending on where your phrase begins. And the flutes, I'll ask you to play with a very pale sound. Avoid using any vibrato. Also, oboes, let your sound at this point, rather than sounding lead, sound like your section merging into the oboe sound. And of the lowest instruments here in the saxophones, we'll ask you to play even the most light lead, so that the, this uh, lighter, color emerges uh, more smoothly. This all serves to the build up to the big return of letter G. So if we handle this sensitively, it can be really beautiful. So let's have everyone please with the pickup to F with those changes. Brass, when you enter, just sneak in.
was very beautiful. No, I'm going to, again, this is optional. It's not in the score, but it's something that I think makes sense. If we find um, 70, bar 79, beat 3, this is in the middle of a long phrase, but here again, I think it musically makes sense if we can separate it into the old idea and the new idea. Perhaps I can illustrate by having, first of all, just the flute and the oboe play what you have here. This is bar 79, starting on beat 3. Right, so we have, it's kind of the beginning of a new idea. Yada di, yada da, yada da di, yada, etc. It's very beautiful. And it's answered in an equally beautiful way by the horns and the euphonium. So can we have those four groups, please? The flute, the oboe, horn, and euphonium, starting at bar 79. Beat three, hearing this melodic statement, and then your answer. everyone into the picture it can be very beautiful and you know it's a very lush and romantic piece to me this is kind of like film music from the 1940s the waves are crashing on the ocean uh, beach and it's nighttime and it's very atmospheric and at the time where there were actors with names like Tyrone so let's try this with everyone please starting on beat three of 79 if you don't mind finding that it's right in the middle and let's see if we can create yet another moment of uh, beautiful drama. One. Working backwards, we finally arrived at the, at the ultimate, the final statement of the main theme, the main melody at G. And the two sections we've been trying to give some extra attention to at E, the full-bodied simple material, and then at F, the very smooth, pale, transparent material that then gradually emerged into something more robust uh, to set up the return of the theme at G. I think this really helps the dramatic pacing of all of those things. So, um, at G, can I just isolate a couple of things here? We've played this all together uh, once. Can I just draw attention to his one, there are two moments here where he's used a marcato or martellato accent in the brass. And one of those is the one I'd like to ask you to do first. This is four and five after G, fourth and fifth bars of G, just the brass that have marcato accents starting on bar four, and. Yeah, and so we're gonna make a conscious decision on how to agree for on a uniform style here of making a slightly bell tone and slightly ping. You remember the, the beautiful job the horns did earlier with their muted hunting horn moment. It's a little bit reminiscent of that. Again, please, same place, fourth of G. Yeah, we'll do that one more time. I'm going to ask you to add a little bit more resonance. So after you play the, the accent, just have a little bit more tone so we get the ring, the bell tone ring. Right, and especially there, yum pa, bum bum ba, because that's the melody that can also be slightly more prominent. The other spot with the marcato accents, I won't bother rehearsing. That's the bar before H, but it's just useful to draw our attention to that, to also let that penetrate through the texture a little bit and grab our attention. Okay, um, rehearsal 
H. Could we start one bar before it, please? We'll play a little bit, and then we'll talk about making some changes. So this is everyone, please, one bar before H. <laughs> H functions both as its own beautiful little segment, but also as a way of setting up uh, a major event, which is kind of the return of something that sounds more settled at I. So uh, can we start at letter H and make a few small changes? Uh, let's hear just the tremolos and make this very light and just a shimmer, like a reflection off the breeze. Sorry, off the waves, off the breeze. Yeah, just like this. Right, like film music for synchronized swimmers or something like that. Okay, now, can I ask all of you to observe your dynamic marks between H and I and take them all down a notch? And what we're going to do is pace the dynamic by suppressing it so that I has more dramatic sense of arrival. And if we do this really well, it can just start in a very gentle fashion and gradually build, saving most of the build for the very, very end. And if we're successful, it can create this little shimmery moment, a little bit like uh, the opening of Daphnis and Chloe. Just nothing, 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 and then emerging into something very beautiful. So can we try this with everyone, please? Right on H. Just with a light shimmer. the downbeat. This is really is a return home in many respects, but most obviously uh, with the harmony and also the richness of the texture from top to bottom. Just the downbeat of I held. So letter I does really feel like a return home, setting up the ending, and should just have that kind of warmth and richness. Be very careful, if you would, two before I, that the whole notes don't become so strong that we miss the movement of the half notes, who are, have essentially the more interesting material in the two bars before I. And finally, uh, add a letter I. Um, let's emphasize the warmth and the richness. Even though it gets big, don't let the tone color become bright. Yeah, so can we do this, please? Two before I, to the end bring out the half notes, a little less on the whole notes, and just play with as much warmth as you can provide at letter I, two before I. Very nice. A few comments about the ending. The last statements, kind of the last gasps of the melody, really lyrically let them come through, especially when it goes in the trombones, as legato as possible and as expressively as possible. So each one of those descending melodic uh, fragments or the recollection of the main melody has a little bit more prominence. There's a lovely touch here at the end in the orchestration, which is um, as the timpani drops out and, and uh, reveals a different color of the low brass and bassoons just to linger in the autumn air. Could we just identify that for a second and hear the, those changes? This is the last four bars, everyone, please. We'll listen to the color change as it goes from everyone plus timpani to everyone minus timpani. <laughs> <laughs> 
far from the end. Yeah, very nice. So for those reasons as well, it's okay. I think it's advisable to take as much time as you like or more over the rests on beat four of three from the end and uh, four from the end. All right, we would love to play the full work in its entirety for you, and I think we would also love to take an A before we do that. So let's do that right now, and then we'll, we'll play from the top. Thank you, everyone.
Bravo, everyone. I'd like to thank the fantastic members of the CCM Wind Orchestra and say that I hope for those of you watching this has been a, a useful opportunity. Thank you all very, very much. Bravo.